brought a, uh, a smile to my face. Uh, the impact of uh, moving from lockdown to uh, red zone has um, really had this great impact, especially for, for the body of Christ. Uh, praise God for that. Uh, let us now um, read our, today's scripture. Uh, it's going to be found in uh, John chapter 13, uh, verse 34. We only have one verse. So I'd like uh, for everyone to unmute their microphones as we uh, read all together this uh, scripture. I can see, I can still see some, uh, it have been unmuted. Okay, let's start, um, okay, let's start um, chapter 13, verse 34. A new command, a new command, I give you, I love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love, you must love one another. Praise be to God for the reading of And for today's preaching, it's about love and forgiveness by our pastor, Alvin Curion. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, today, we will uh, focus on the topic of forgiveness. In fact, I've entitled my sermon today, a short sermon today, The Greatest Command, Love and Forgive. Um, and I'll explain to you why. Um, because we want to look into the idea of separating out our forgiveness of the person from their actions. It's often, um, it's often our own failure to do this separation that keeps us from engaging in life-giving command to forgive. But God has wisdom and He's given us revelation for, for each and every child of his. So that when we look and when we look at his word, then we will have the freedom in our hearts today if we'll engage with him in true study and true prayer. See, true healing occurs when this happens. Paradoxically, uh, healing means moving from your pain to the pain. So when we keep focusing on the specific circumstances of your pain, uh, you easily become angry, it's easy to become resentful, and it's easy to be vindictive. You are inclined to do something about the externals of your pain in order to relieve it. And this explains why we often seek revenge. But he, real healing comes from realizing that your pain, your own particular pain, is a share of humanity's pain. That realization allows you to forgive your enemies and enter into a truly compassionate life. Every time you can shift your attention away from the external situation that caused you that pain, and then now focus on your on the pain of humanity in which you participate your then your suffering becomes easier to bear it, in other words just like in what it says in Matthew 11:30 it becomes now a light burden and an easy yoke but today my prayer is that you will find true healing and you will find a newfound freedom from the weight of unforgiveness today. Before we do that, let's just pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you because you have forgiven us. And we forgive because you have forgiven us first. And that while we were your sinners, Christ died for us. And thank you, Lord, because based on this love and mercy and grace, you have now given us this command to love one another. But we can only truly love if we truly forgive from our heart. So I pray, O oh God, today that you will just teach us. O oh Holy Spirit, soften our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The scripture says that Jesus, in talking to his disciples, said, A new command I give you, 
that you love one another. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. See, one of the most important distinctions to make when learning um, when learning about uh, what happens in the mind is this. When we think of the thoughts, we're the playing the sequence of one's of uh, someone's wrongful action over and over again in your mind. See, when you think of someone and and that someone causing you so much pain, and you think of it over and over in your mind and in your thoughts, then it is now a terrible hindrance to obeying God's command to forgive. When we continually reflect on how wrong an action was, our thoughts act as a blockade between our hearts and God's heavenly compassion. Now, this could be better explained uh, when we look at his word. In John 13, 34, it tells us, A new command I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. Why does God forgive? Why does God forgive us? He forgives us because He loves us. That's number one. It is because of that love uh, that un, un, that um, faithful love, that unfailing love that He has granted us. And He forgives us because of His nature. Not because our actions are ever worthy of forgiveness. Not because we deserve His forgiveness. It's because He Himself loves us. He is a loving God. That's His nature. Why does, for, why does God forgive? A second reason is because He forgives because He values a restored relationship with us over our sins. See, He is a God of justice. And He requires that there is no sin in His presence. Because He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. But he forgives us because he wants more than our sins. He, he wants us to have a restored relationship and fellowship with him. That was his original intent in the Garden of Eden. When he created everything and then he created man, he said it was very good. And that is because it is in, in his heart to be able to have fellowship, to be able to have that perfect relationship with his created being and because of the fall because of sin because of pride uh, man fell and then ever since he has promised that he will one day restore that broken relationship so why does God forgive he forgives because he loves us he also forgives because he values a restored relationship with us but he also forgives because he is filled with love for us not because our acts of confession demand forgiveness from him and sometimes we say well i confess my sin to god therefore he promised that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins yes he is just because he promised that he will forgive us our sins he will cleanse us from unrighteousness if we confess there's that condition but this is not the real reason. The real reason is because God is so filled with love for us. And because He loves us so much, because it is in His nature that He loves us so much that He gave the very best for us. He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross, to be the ultimate substitute for our sins. The, the, the punishment that we were supposed to receive Jesus took on when he died on that cross. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And he says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Jesus says this because he loved his disciples. God loves his disciples. God loves Jesus' disciples. And he wants his followers, he wants the believers to know that 
He loves them, therefore they should love others. Therefore they should also serve others. Serve the world. See, we look here at the example of Peter and Thomas, two of his disciples. When Peter denied Jesus three times, he offered him relationship. He offered him relationship and another opportunity to serve him. In other words, friends, God is a God of second chances. And he always forgives. In fact, he told his disciples this himself. And when he was asked the question, how many times should I forgive my brother? The answer is 70 times 7. That doesn't mean that someone is writing down, you know, if, if you have a wife of uh, 25, 30 years, and you're counting each and every uh, uh, sin or um, offense that he or she makes to you. And it once it reaches 70 times 7, which is uh, 140, then that's it. <laughs> you cannot say that's it. This is God's command. I'm free from this command. I'm free uh, so that I now don't have to forgive you. What that means is that you will always forgive. There will never be a time that you can never forgive someone, regardless of the pain, regardless of the depth of the pain that they caused you. And also Thomas, his example was that he was filled with doubt. But then Jesus offered him his nail-pierced hands. Here, come, see. So, sometimes man demands proof, uh, demands proof of God's power of healing, of promise of healing and forgiveness. Jesus' proof is that, here, I died on the cross for you. And that's not just a historical fact. It's a real event. It's a real uh, piece of reality that we all should believe because it's written in the Holy Scriptures. And so for us then, just like Thomas, just like Peter, when we sin against God, He offers us forgiveness that we might receive the full depths of His love again. Amen. Glory to God. Luke 6.37 says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Do not judge, do not condemn, and forgive. Our job is not to judge or condemn the actions of another. The only one worthy of passing judgment is already seated on his throne. And Jesus alone would be that judge. There will be a time that the white throne judge, white, uh, great white throne judgment, where he will judge the living and the dead. And he will be a God who is fair, God who will judge with his righteous right hand. And God alone is perfect and able to offer sound judgment. He alone carries the burden of being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And He continually chooses to show mercy and compassion on the undeserving. Question is, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as someone who is deserving of God's forgiveness and love? That means you're not truly broken. You're not really broken in your heart. And you have not truly realized the depth and the 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 the, the depth of your sin against him. So he only chooses, he continually chooses to show mercy and compassion on the undeserving. And he continually offers forgiveness to the unworthy and the sinful. He continually runs out to meet us in our sin, like the father of the prodigal son. But mind you, friends, showing compassion for the wrongful actions of another is not easy. When we are called to love because God first loved us, it's not that easy, but it is necessary. How then should we show mercy? How then should we live? 
Should we continually live a life of forgiving, forgiving others? If we are to live a lifestyle of continual forgiveness the way God commands, we must look to the heart, to the very heart of the person and receive God's compassion rather than taking up the seat of judgment. If we are to love one another as God has loved us, we must value relationship over worldly justice and give grace where none is deserved. May we obtain, friends, access to the heart of our Heavenly Father. And that's my prayer today as we seek to love as He loves. May we be filled with compassion for others after reflection on the overwhelming grace that we've been shown. And finally, my prayer is that we, we be filled with courage and strength to reach past a wrongful action that someone has done to us and forgive them, forgive the person from our hearts. My prayer is this. My prayer is that you will meditate on God's command to judge not. Allow the scripture to renew your mind to the important command of forgiving others. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but, who, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. And my prayer too is that you ask ourselves, what action have you recently done that you deem unforgivable in your mind? What are some of the things that you see as unforgivable? Where are you struggling to forgive a person because of the way they've wronged you? See, as you think about these things, I ask God now to give you the ability to look past a wrongful action to the heart of the person so that you might have compassion and offer forgiveness. See, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. No one is perfect. Spend time in His presence now to remove yourself from the seat of judgment so that you can offer grace and forgiveness. Psalm 103 says this, verses 10 to 14. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are from above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. That's who we are. We are in these mortal bodies. But there will be a time that we will be given glorified bodies. And that will be a time where we will spend eternity with him. But before that happens, we should remember that we are imperfect. What happens when we forgive, friends? When we offer forgiveness where none is deserved, we are placing our hope for justice and reconciliation in God rather than ourselves. See, when we offer mercy, we look to heaven for all things to be set right and renewed rather than looking to this fallen and folly-filled world. There is no perfection in this world. There's nothing we can do to completely rid this world of its inherent depravity. Life is unfair. It will always be unfair. So we must look to our Heavenly Father to work and heal as He wills and follow in His footsteps. In other words, we must carry an atmosphere of grace so that heaven can meet earth through our lives. And draw people into the fold of God. We must be that salt. We must be that light to the world. We must be that attractive to the world. We must be able to shock the world with our behavior, with our values. May we have the strength 
friends, and the perspective to place our hope in heaven and offer mercy, offer compassion and forgiveness to the wrongful destitute and to the proud. I would like to end with this story. Corrie ten Boom and her family resisted the Nazis by hiding Jews in their home. They were ultimately discovered and sent to a concentration camp. Cory barely survived this ordeal, and she barely survived until the end of the war. Her family members died in captivity. So, seared by this terrible trial by fire, Cory's faith in God also survived. And she spent much of her time in the post-war years after World War II, traveling to Germany and elsewhere in Europe, sharing her faith in Christ. But on one occasion in 1947, while speaking in a church in Munich, she noticed a balding man in gray overcoat near the rear of the basement room. She had been speaking on the subject of God's forgiveness, but her heart froze within her when she recognized the man. She could picture him as she had seen him so many times before in his blue Nazi uniform with his visored cap the cruelest of the guards at the Ravensbrück camp where Corey had suffered the most horrible indignities and where her own sister had died. Yet here he was at the end of her talk coming up the aisle toward her with his hand thrust out, thank you. Thank you for your fine message. He said, how wonderful it is to know that all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. Yes, Corey said that. He had said that. She had spoken so easily of God's forgiveness. But here he was, a man, the man whom he despised, she despised and condemned with every fiber of her being. And she couldn't extend forgiveness to the Nazi oppressor. She realized that this man didn't remember her. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands? You mentioned Ravenstock. Ravensbrock, the man continued, his hand still extended. I was a guard there. I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's true. But since then, I've come to know Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. It has been hard for me to forgive myself for all the cruel things I did, but I know God has forgiven me. And please, if you would, I would like to hear from your lips too that God has forgiven me. And Corey recorded a response in her book. She said this in her book. I stood there, I whose sins had again and again been forgiven and could not forgive. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. It was as simple as as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into one stretched out to me. As I did, an incredible thing took place. My current started in my shoulder, raced down on my arm, sprang into my, our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being. Bringing tears to my eyes, I forgive you, brother, I cried. With all my heart, for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands. The former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Friends, there is no perfection in this world. This world will never be fair. See, we cannot ever get rid of evil in this world. But we must look to the Father to work out His healing. We must look to Jesus as 
he will continue to help us to follow in his footsteps. We must continue to have that grace in our lives so that heaven can come down to earth to us. Friends, may we have the strength. May we have the ability today by the Holy Spirit to place our hope in heaven. Offer mercy, grace, compassion, and forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Let us pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, my prayer today is that you will allow us, Lord, to just remember your grace, remember your mercy that you showed us. And that, Lord, we will forgive whatever good works that we have done where nothing comes as good to you. All these are like filthy rags before you. And you, in your justice, in your faithfulness, in your perfection, Lord, reach down to us sinners. Reach down to me. And you showed me your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Pastor Alvin, for um, today's preaching. As we um, um, move towards our Lord's Supper, uh, I'd like to ask Pastor for the uh, short preaching for the Lord's Supper. Thank you, uh, Brother Chad. So um, as we prepare for the Lord's uh, Supper, Lord's Table, uh, I would just like to ask you a question. Um, because, um, you know, if you consider yourself a Christian today, one of the things that we regularly do together as a community is the Lord's Supper. And even in the culture of Jesus' time, they would always uh, gather together as family, as friends, and they would have all these festivals. In fact, there are a total of seven festivals. And... Uh, it's good for them to be able to gather and eat and have food in front of them. And that's called a celebration. And uh, they would celebrate and remember. Remember what? Remember the faithfulness of God in their lives. So for the Jewish person, it's important that they celebrate with food, with drinks. That's why we've passed on. They've, uh, we have um, followed the tradition up till today. And even in the Filipino culture, I'm sure other cultures like Pakistani culture, we would have that kind of festive celebrations, right? But uh, this practice of the communion, you know, is also called the Eucharist, the Lord's table, breaking of the bread, fellowship meal, and all that. What do we actually do? We try to remember. We remember. We remember what? Because, um, you know, we have, to we have to say that we are a forgetful people. We tend to forget things. And so um, it's, it's good for us to be reminded of the many blessings that uh, we have received. Of course, the best blessing of all, brothers and sisters, is that uh, we have received God's love. And we have received God's forgiveness. And uh, we talked about that today in the sermon. And um, Romans 5, 8 says that he demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So my question is, have you realized how sinful we are? Have you realized how great God's grace is? See, the body and the blood of Jesus on that cross should lead us to this realization. The sad thing though is we get used to the ritual and sometimes 
uh, or most of the time, we lose the reason for why we do such things. See, the story has been uh, told about a woman who bought a book. And when she got home, she bought a book, she got home, and she read a few pages of the book, but then he tossed it right away somewhere in her bedroom. So she's not interested and she forgot about the book. So one time she was invited to a party when she met someone. She had a good time with this person and she found out that he was the author of that book that she bought. So when she got home, the first thing she did was to look for this book that she threw away. So upon finding it, she embraced it. And now reading it with a new perspective. So it is the best book in the world for her. Why? Because she had a relationship with the author. So we always relate to this kind of story with the Bible. But I believe that we can also relate this to the Lord's Supper or the communion. See, we have this personal, wonderful, loving relationship with Jesus who asked us to remember him. And so when we do this, when we, when we participate in communion, we are doing that. We are trying to please Jesus because he asked us to do this in remembrance of him. Because we have a relationship with Jesus who showed us his love by dying on that cross and being the substitute for our sin debt. So receiving that bread and receiving this cup should invoke in us a lot of emotions or realizations. It should invoke in, in, in us love, friendship, gratefulness, humility, care and concern, and so much more. So as we participate today, right now, actually, in the Lord's table, let's remember that we are doing this because we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And so in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, I will read, for I received from the Lord that also which I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all now together partake of the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. That's all partake of the cup. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's ask Brother Chad to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Pastor. Let's pray. Lord, uh, words are not enough to, to say and express how grateful we are when you uh, sacrifice yourself up to the point of death in order to restore our relationship with you and be forgiven uh, from our sins. Thank you for allowing us to be part of this communion as we remember the time when you offered your body and blood by dying on the cross as the ultimate substitute for our sins. And by resurrecting on the third day, you've conquered sin and death. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for um, um, the uh, Lord's Supper, for leading us. And as we, um, uh, for a closing prayer and benediction, may I ask again, uh, Pastor Alvin, to 
uh, lead us in our closing prayer and uh, benediction. Amen, amen. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord. Thank you because you are a good, loving God. We thank you, Lord, because you sacrifice your own life for us. And that's the reason why we're gathered together as a church family, as brothers and sisters, because we do celebrate your death. And Lord, we thank you because even though we are living in perilous times, we see death everywhere. We see the darkness around us. We see all the evil um, schemes stored against your own people. Lord, we can look forward to the day when you yourself promised that um, you yourself promised, Lord, that you will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with us. You drink it with us in your Father's kingdom. And so, Lord, we know that all these things will soon come to pass. And we will finally one day experience your holy and loving presence as we look forward to the day of your arrival. But for now, oh God, we will continue to proclaim your Lord's death, the Lord's death, until you come. And we will continue, Lord, to remember. And by remembering, oh God, we will continue to live lives that are worthy of this calling, oh God, that you called us to do. Lord, I pray for each and every family represented here today. For your Lord, for every individual who continually prays, Lord, for that prayer request. Pray for each and everyone's health. Pray for those who are suffering, those whom we know, Lord, that they're still in the hospital or in ICUs. Those whose lives are on edge, whose mental makeup, Lord, mental health is also compromised. Lord, we pray for our teenagers. We pray, Lord, that uh, our children as well, Lord, uh, will continue, Lord, to persevere through online classes, online learning. And as parents, oh God, we, for those who are working, that you will continue to protect each one each and every frontline worker, essential worker. Those who work from home, oh Lord, that they may continue to have the motivation. Those of us, Lord, who are continually uh, meeting with people, Lord, who, who are lost, that we may have that sensitivity of the Holy Spirit to be, bear powerful witness, Lord, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even this week, Lord, as we consider uh, attending an orientation about sharing the gospel, sharing, our, sharing the good news, we pray that you will work in each and everyone's heart that we will not do this, Lord, because we are forced to, but we will do this because we love you. And we love you, Lord, because you first loved us and gave up your life for us. That's why we want to learn how to effectively share the gospel so that we may be filled with courage. We may be filled with boldness, oh God, because you yourself said that the spirit that is living within us is more powerful than the spirit that is in the world. And that, Lord, uh, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, of power, and a sound mind. So, Lord, my prayer is that as we dismiss from this place, we will contemplatively reflect and, and decide to attend this coming Saturday's orientation for EE, for Evangelism Explosion. And that will have a profound effect on the church, your church, and FCAC. As we all do this together, as we will all uh, consider to, to study faithfully and to diligently um, uh, uh, equip ourselves so that we may truly proclaim and remember the gospel of your death, your power, and your resurrection until the day you come. We worship you, we love you, and now may the love of the Father the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit may be upon all of us 
here now and forever. Amen. 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 That concludes today's service. God bless everyone and see you next week.